Howdy folks, my name is Todd Kraus. I work with the Linguistics Research Center at the University of Texas at Austin. And today I'd like to talk to you about everything you never wanted to know about Old Norse. So hopefully you guys are surviving the pandemic without too much trouble. I hope everybody is safe and healthy. I hope you are comfortable in your home or in some relaxed setting. I hope it's okay with you that I'm wearing my formal conference tie-dye today. Uh, I'd like to share with you some little tidbits that I like about Old Norse and you might not get in your standard fare and your reading on Old Norse on your own. So I hope you enjoy this and feel free to reach out with questions afterwards. So I want to take you through a little background. I want to take you through Old Norse's nuclear family, its closest relatives. I want to show you how Old Norse chatted with the neighbors. Uh, then we'll look at its extended family and the bigger family tree. And then I'll summarize. If you want to learn more, feel free to go to the Linguistics Research Center where we have free resources. Among those, a free online course on Old Norse in case you'd like to learn more formally. Okay, so what is Old Norse? You probably already know, but just in case you don't, it's roughly speaking the language of the Vikings. Uh, the Viking age coincides with roughly a period of Scandinavian expansion, which happened roughly the 8th to 11th centuries of the Common Era. You can argue a little earlier, you can argue a little later, that's fine. I'm not trying to pin it down very precisely here. For the most part, you had expansion in two directions. One direction is west, where they ran into the British Isles, then they hit Iceland, then they hit Greenland. They all went all the way to the New World a good 400 years before uh, Columbus made his famous voyages. They also went to the east. They went into the East Slavic region at that time, which is now Western Russia and uh, Ukraine, uh, the Bielorussia area. Uh, at this point, they also even made their way over the inland seas to Constantinople, to Byzantium and the Byzantine Empire, and even to the Arabic speaking region of the world. Uh, so they were incredibly widely traveled, perhaps the most widely traveled European group during this particular period in time. Old Norse itself, roughly speaking, is the language of the Vikings, but actually typically when you refer to the language Old Norse itself, you're often referring to the language of the sagas. The sagas often take place during the Viking Age, although they were written down much later, often a good one, two or three centuries later. Uh, but you can argue that perhaps they were already beginning to be orally composed even at some point during the Viking Age itself. Um, so I'd like to look at how Old Norse is related to its nearby Germanic languages. And just to give you a sense of the language that we're talking about here, I have here the parable of the sower and the seed from the New Testament translated in Old Norse, in Old English for comparison and then for reference in modern English, right? So just to give you a sense now, mind you, I'm going to use a somewhat reconstruction of pronunciation, trying to emulate the sounds as scholars think that they might have been spoken at the time that these texts would have been written. Uh, another traditional pronunciation is to use modern Icelandic pronunciation, which is also perfectly valid. So this might have sounded something like him er salvin sarisin fa fer han ut op meven han er a wegenum fa feller fund nir i hja wegenum ok koma fuglarat ok etta The parallel Old English would have been something like this 
Ut eude se sedre hi sed tu fawen, on tha he seu sum fen with thon away, on fuglas komen, on hi tre. And all this roughly means out went the sower to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell along the way, and birds came and ate. And hopefully you've noticed that the things I've marked in like colors are generally pretty darn similar to one another. Savvy, sad, seed, right? Saw, saw in to sow, fell, fell, sum, sumt, right? Vague, vague, right? They put the definite article oftentimes right after the word in Old Norse, coma, coman, right? So these languages are pretty obviously, if you start focusing on the words, they're pretty clearly close to one another. And something that's interesting, which I highlighted here in yellow, is if you look at the word for eat, right, they ate it, <laughs> the modern English is quite different from the Old English, but it's quite close to Old Norse. So I'll get back to that in, in a moment. Uh, but first, what do, how can we talk about languages being similar in a more concrete way? So to discuss this, I want to go to a situation for a moment that you probably likely find more familiar. That is the situation in the Romance languages, right? The Romance languages like French, Spanish, Italian, Romanian, Portuguese, many others that have smaller numbers of speakers. Uh, but are no less important. They all form a family, and we're pretty familiar with talking about the Romance languages as a family, and we have a sort of intuitive sense of what we mean by that, which is that they all are languages that earlier stem from Latin, which is a classical language, a language of which we have many, many documents, right? And the similarities in these languages are due to their coming from that common source. We characterize their differences by looking at sound changes, right? So the Latin word vita did not stay the same into the daughter Romance languages. It changed. How did it change? Well, we characterize that change by sound rules. We say that if you look at a T between vowels, in Italian, nothing happened to that. It stayed exactly the same. But in Spanish, it changed to a D, whereas in French, it fell away, right? And it wouldn't be interesting if this only happened in one word, right? That would just be an accident. But when we're talking about sound rules, we're saying that actually any time you have this T between vowels, it undergoes those changes, those same changes in Italian, Spanish, or French, right? So that the T between vowels in fata also stays the same in Italian, becomes a D in Spanish, and falls away in French. Right? Sometimes you have to be clever with these rules and realize, well, it's not just anywhere between vowels. If there's a consonant immediately preceding it, then the rule is slightly different. Again, in Italian, nothing changes, but in Spanish, the T does not change to a D. It stays a T because that consonant is in front of it. And it does not fall away in French because that consonant is in front of it. It stays there. And again, if it were just that word, uninteresting. But any time you have a T preceded by a consonant, those are the things that happen in the respective languages. And it's not just consonants. It's also vowels as well. So turns out that generally A stays an A in all of those languages, except when it's at the end of a syllable, and then in French, it changes to an E, right? And so do realize that these sound rules are talking about how you map from the parent language to the daughter language. But what we're really talking about is that in the broader Latin speaking community over time, there was a community that kept the pronunciation of T's the same. There was a community that started to shift the pronunciation of that T between vowels to a D. There was a community where 
neither of those things happened. They actually pronounced it so weakly that it just fell out of the language in that position, right? So we're really talking about speech communities, but we characterize those by the sound changes that apply in those specific communities. So you look at the Germanic languages like Old English and Old Norse, and here I've added Gothic for comparison, which is the oldest document of, of the Germanic languages. Uh, and you can see that they, they obey roughly the same sort of pattern, right? That you see that there's a speaking area here and a speaking area here where a D between vowels undergoes no change, but there's a speaking area where that same sound changes to this letter as a D with a bar through it, which is just like it sounds in the name of the letter, ev. It's the TH in English bays. Uh, so again, it wouldn't be interesting if we just noted this in one word, but it's the same anytime you get that D between vowels. And similarly for other combinations, when you see a dia sound, well, it's a via in the Old Norse region and it's a double D sound, so bid them here in the Old English speaking area. Again, not interesting if it's just one word, but that same change happens in any word with this combination. So you get the sense that, well, we can see sound different sound rules applying in different regions but there's no real parent to speak of like we had latin in the romance language what if there were however well we could sort of play a theoretical game and assume that there actually was parent language we'll call it proto-germanic so that it's sort of the origin of the germanic languages and then you say if you start out with a word of this form you apply the rule that it, the D between vowels stays the same here, and also between vowels, it stays the same here, but between vowels, it becomes ev here. Well, then we can play that same sort of game where we say, because these languages come from a common source, they have similarities, but then within different speaking regions, we have different rules that characterize how things were pronounced in those regions. And in that way, we reconstruct a parent to what we can now really claim to be a linguistic family in the same way that Latin was the parent of the linguistic family of the Romance languages that we already know and love. The trick is with Latin, you already know that that language was out there and existed because we've had its documents for millennia. What about Proto-Germanic, right? That's just something we came up with out of figments of our imagination. So what reality does that have? So if you step back for a minute, I pointed out that the sagas were written much later than the, the Viking age for the most part, but that doesn't mean there wasn't writing during the Viking age. And what you do have is you have runic inscription, right? And this is Gormstone here. This dates to roughly about 900 to 950 of the Common Era. And there's also a line on the back of this stone. And here is a transcription of this inscription here, right? One letter for each rune here. It starts here. So this is Urmer which is, the, and here are the two dots there that you see there. So this is King Gorm carved this stone for Thirdway, his wife, Denmark's adornment. So this stone is particularly important because it's the earliest uh, written evidence of the term Denmark for this region of the world. So that's pretty interesting. Right? So you notice that this, this is not a particularly mystical or poetic stone carving right it's really sort of it's a, it's nice because it's a memorial stone but it also serves as propaganda for the king right? so that is actually the function of many runic inscriptions and so this comes probably a couple of centuries before you start talking about writing the sagas but there's actually earlier inscriptions than those even still runic inscriptions, but centuries earlier. So here's a nice one. This 
is one, a replica actually, of one of the Galahus horns. And you can see some incredible decorations here. But you see right up here, there's actually an inscription in ruins there. And so actually that's where it begins, I believe. So we'll see that right here, All right? So here are those beginning runes. Here is that runic inscription uh, splayed out continuously from beginning to end. And this inscription dates to roughly 300 of the common era. So this is what a good 600 years before that other inscription I showed you, right? And this is actually earlier than Gothic, which is the earliest documented of the documented Germanic languages, right? So this is a pretty archaic inscription, right? And so you look at it and you say, it says ich, which is in German, ich, in Middle English, ich, and in Modern English, I. Plowagastes, that's actually a proper name, but you can see the element for the word guest here in Old Norse, it would be gestar, where this would be an E and this I would be gone. So this isn't really Old Norse at this point. This is similar to Gothic, but still just a little different. Uh, this flewa is cognate with the word lee, as in the leeward side of the ship. Uh, Holtigas, this is a word son of Holt. Horna, you can probably guess what that means, right? Horn. Fawido, which is, if I recall correctly, this is cognate with, for example, German tun, right, to do, to make. So I, Fluagaster, son of Holt, made this horn, right? So this is much more archaic, in fact, than Old Norse, and it's more archaic even than Gothic. This comes from the time that we actually are thinking that Proto-Germanic, if it existed, would have been spoken. These are documents of Proto-Germanic. And so they actually allow us to turn this head game of reconstructing a language into reality and actually check whether we're just making things up or if our rules and reconstructions actually hold water. And for the most part, they do, and if they didn't, then we'd go back to the drawing board and revise our game, right? But this actually looks like how we reconstruct Proto-Germanic. So it seems like Proto-Germanic actually was a language that was spoken, and sometimes you're lucky, and you actually get documents from it. So now let's talk about how Old Norse chatted with its neighbors. Uh, by that I mean, the Vikings expanded to the east and west, as we had pointed out. In particular, they came into contact with folks on the British Isles, and they came into contact en masse, right? So it's one thing to say that the Viking Age started with uh, the raid on Lindisfarne way up there in the north in 793, if I have my dates correct, right? That's just a sort of incidental little a uh, bit of contact, which a bummer for the monks involved, but still incidental, right? But after <laughs> the Scandinavians realized that you had the British Isles here, they said, hey, that would be a nice place to settle. And so they came in large numbers. And for the most part, they settled roughly in this region here, which came to be known as the Dane Law, right? You can see that that is a huge region. Right. Notice that this whole region here is what was the English speaking world at that time. Right. And so they full on occupy, let's, you could roughly say a half, at least a third of the English speaking world at that time. So Old Norse and Old English came into very close contact with one another and it stayed close for a long time. And you can see the evidence of this contact in really interesting ways. One of the most interesting is in place names that still survive in English to this day. Here you can see a lot of the settlements and ones that have Scandinavian elements to the place name. And so scholars like to group these place names in two rough categories, right? And the first one is words like these here. So, ah, river, which you can find as an element in Greta and Reza. 
Feria, ferry, as in Ferriby and Ferry Bridge. Gil, which means a ravine, as in Low Gill and Long Gill. Kiar, brushwood, as in Red Car and Broad Car. Mose, which is moss, as in Rathmos and Mosedale. Right? So these, if you think about what binds these words together, is they're all sort of referring to the land as you find it, right? No human intervention there, right? They're, they refer to the natural lay of the land. Now, if you look at another group of words, here you have, play, you have names of natural occurrences, right? But that are elements of place names. So, Bur, which is farm, as in Derby, Winter, Grove, right? You might think that this was really, this should be the word land and not Winter, but if you look at the earlier spelling of this word, you see it's not the word land. Similarly with Skogr, right? Is that really Skogr? Well, if you look at the earlier spelling of it, you can see that that's where it comes from. Thorpe, Winthorpe, Thwaite. Basin Thwaite. These are referring to natural places that require human invention, right? Humans have to be involved to make land into a farm or to make a region into a hamlet or they have to delineate a parcel of land. So scholars like to see here the potential for a first round of settlers settling just wherever they find free land to settle. And then another round of settlers who are settling in what's left. And so what do you think might have happened here? Perhaps it's that the great heathen army went through roughly in the middle of the 800s. And as that army disbanded after harrying all over this region here, the folks who were in the army had to find out where to settle down and all of the free land was already taken so they could only take up land that had to be worked before it could be settled. So that's one potential idea, right? But if nothing else, you see that the influence of Scandinavian languages on English of this period is really uh, profuse. Right? Another interesting story is this one. Right? So check this out, right? So we we've decided that Proto-Germanic is a thing and it had words and we can reconstruct those words. And so one of those words that we reconstruct is Skurkula, right? And that will have been inherited into Old English, originally with a very early pronunciation of Skurke, right? But there's a rule in Old English after a certain period, all of the sk combinations become sh like we represent with modern SH. And so skurka would have very quickly become pronounced as shirka. And then that would have been inherited into Middle English as sherka. And that's what gives you New English or Modern English shirt, right? What I mean. However, you might wonder, well, if we have shirt and the sh comes from changing all of the skus to sh, how in tarnation do we have the word skirt? Because shouldn't that sk have been changed to sh? And say, yeah, you're exactly right. If it had come through Old English. But what actually happened there is you go back to Proto-Germanic, that same root would have been inherited into Old Norse as skirta. In Old Norse, you don't have that rule apply. Sk stays sk. It doesn't turn into sh, and that would give you an middle and then modern Icelandic skirta. But in that middle period, the period of Middle English, it seems like there were a lot of Scandinavians inhabiting close to a bunch of English. And evidently, you can make up whatever sort of motivation you, you can imagine, right? Evidently, I, as an English speaker, was wearing my shirt, but I looked at my neighboring Scandinavian, and I really loved what he was wearing. And I said, I really love that. What is that? I want to have one made for myself. And he'd say, oh, that's my skirta. Oh, skirta? Oh, that's pretty cool. That's what I'll call that. I need to get me a skirta. And that's what came to be a skirt, right? So these two words in the Middle English period existed side by side, 
the one that came directly from Proto-Germanic through English, and the one we borrowed from Old Norse in that Middle English period and gives us modern skirt. So there are some words actually that this is kind of interesting as well, right? There are some words where it's actually hard to figure out where the modern English comes from. It could just as easily come from the Old English or the Old Norse. So this Proto-Germanic root bloman gives you Old English bloma, no Norse blomi, either of those could give you Middle English bloma and New English bloom. Turns out that this one in the documents we have generally means in ingot or some sort of block of metal ore, whereas this one tends to mean a flower, and so it's likely to have come from the Old Norse root, but it could have come from the Old English. Also, this Proto-Germanic root, giftis, this would give you Old English gift and Old Norse gift. Either of those would give you Middle English gift, and that gives you Modern English gift. This could come from either of those, but this, in the documents we have, tends to refer specifically to a dowry for a bride. This often refers to a dowry, but it often also has the more general meaning of just something given. And so that's perhaps a little more likely as the source of the modern English word. But on linguistic grounds, either of them could be the source. So that's how close-knit the ties between Scandinavians and the English were in the British Isles at that time. And this goes on for a long time, well into the tail end of the Middle English period, right? You have the Old Norse word egg and the Old English word a. These both give you in Middle English egg with plural eggs and a with plural eiren, right? You gotta love that plural, right? What's the only other word we have in English that has that plural? Child, right? Children. So it would have been great if that had survived, right? But there is a point where this writer says, what should a man in these days now write? Egis or Eirin? Certainly it is hard to please every man. Right? 1490, these two words are still used side by side to the point that this guy is a little ticked off that he doesn't know which one to use, right? That is awesome, right? That, right? Don't you think that that's great? This is... Right, this is less than 100 years before Shakespeare is born. And these words are still parallel. Imagine if that had survived and you, you use one egg in your recipe and two eggs in, that would have been awesome. But um, alas, it didn't come to pass. So that is what happens when the Scandinavians go west and hit the British Isles. But they also went east, mostly from what is now modern Sweden, right? Scandinavians went east into what is modern Russia. And at that period, the Kievan Hoof, right? This is where Old Russian was spoken. And they had their impact there as well, right? You can tell from the types of words that remain in Old Russian what kind of contact they had, right? So you have in Old Russian, pud birkovsk, so a pound, as in the money, from Burka. What's Burka? Burka is a major trading port right there, basically, in Sweden. You have yaska, which is basket, from Old Norse asker, in English ash, right? as in the ash tree. So this is a particular serving vessel made out of the wood of this tree. You have shigla, which is a mass from Old Norse sigla, meaning the same thing. You have tivun, right, meaning a steward from Old Norse hion. Uh, this is corresponds to English thane, so an attendant. Right. So you have a whole slew of words that give you a sense of what kind of commerce they had going on between Eastern Scandinavia and uh, Western Russia uh, in modern terms. Right? But you also have some really striking proper names that themselves come from the Scandinavian speaking world, right? So Rurik, right, from Rurik, 
Igor from Ingvar, Oleg from Helgi, and Olga from Helga, right? These are iconic Russian names, right? These are important names throughout the history, but especially the early history of Russia. And they come straight from uh, Old Norse interactions, right? And this is a picture uh, retelling a famous story where supposedly Scandinavians came and founded the original ruling dynasty of the early East Slavs. Now, whether you take that as historical fact or not, that is debatable, right? But you can see here that those names of that early dynasty definitely have a Scandinavian origin. So, right, that is the Scandinavians talking with their nearest neighbors, but let's go back a moment to this idea of reconstructing the family tree. And let's see just how far we can go, right? So we already know that Latin is the parent language of the Romance languages. We decided that Proto-Germanic is the parent language of the Germanic languages. Well, those are two languages. They seem both to have existed. This one even has some attestation in the historical record. We got two languages near one another. Are they related to one another? Can we play that same game, right? Here you have one group of languages with the parent. Here you have another group of languages with the parent. These are two languages. Do they have a common parent? Turns out they do. A good way to see it is to actually include not just Latin in your comparison with the Germanic languages, but also other ancient languages like Greek, Old Church Slavonic, the oldest documented of the Slavic languages, roughly from the region of modern day Bulgaria, but also Macedonia. Sanskrit, the earliest documented of the Indic languages of the Indo-Aryan uh, members of, of the languages of India, right? If you bring those other languages into your discussion, you can make up for any sort of omissions that Latin might have, right? So you can see that Latin has some similarity to German languages, but that similarity extends way all the way over to India, right? I mean, this looks very much like the Gothic word. You have to understand that Greek has a tendency to lose S's, especially between vowels, but also initially sometimes, right? Uh, sometimes they turn into H's, which is what happens here, right? But if you look across here, you have remarkable similarities here. You'd say, Todd, well, maybe that's just you picking the data. Well, in some sense, it is me picking the data, right? But you say, well, I can think of many words that aren't the same. And I'd say, yeah, but if you look at them, even when they're not the same, you will find regular correspondences in key words in the vocabulary that we look to as marking relatedness between languages. So for example, you might rightly note, hey, Todd, the word for father in Latin is pater, but it's father in English, right? Those don't even start with the same sound, right? They're totally different sounds. You say, but compare pater to pater in Greek, right? Those are clearly similar, even with Sanskrit, totally similar, right? But totally different from English. And I say, being different is not a problem. Like with Spanish, right? Vita became vida, the T changed to a D. Being different is not a problem. It, the question is, is that change regular? So every time I have a P that I want to associate with an F in the Germanic languages, will P in another word correspond to F in the associated words in Germanic? And they do, right? So every time you have a P, in the corresponding words in this group of languages, you have an F in this group of languages. And that happens not just for one word, but for all the words where you have a P and an F, right? And it's not just P and F, right? It, when you have T over here, you have TH over here in the Germanic languages, not just one word, but all words. And so this correspondence, this happens with not just the P and the T, but several sounds, 
Uh, this correspondence is what goes under the title of Grimm's Law, named after Jakob Grimm, one of the brothers Grimm of the fairy tales. Okay. Uh, he was the first one to really expressly codify this uh, group of correspondences, although Rasmus Rask had actually uh, outlined some of it before, before him even. So what happens is you end up reconstructing in this way, the correspondence or the relationship between the Germanic languages and the Slavic languages, and not only, uh, sorry, the Romance languages, and not only those, but the Slavic languages and even Indic languages in this way, right? And you build up a family tree that becomes very robust in the same way we built up the family tree of Proto Germanic, which was modeled after how you built the family tree of the Romance language, right? And so we have a lot of relatives and where these branches split is in some sense an, a measure of how similar these languages are to one another. The farther back the split, the less similar they are. But the interesting thing is even in a language like Old Norse, the parent of the Scandinavian languages, you find remnants of things of traits that you find in languages that branched off much earlier like Hittite and Tocharian. So let me just point out these two interesting tidbits. So Hittite, the language of ancient Anatolia, so modern day Turkey, right? Earliest documented of the Indo-European languages, if I'm not uh, misremembering, most of the early documents go back to about 1350 before the Common Era. There are even some hieroglyphic texts in the Anatolian languages that predate these by a century or two, if I recall correctly. Right? But in these cuneiform texts, early in the decipherment, scholars recognized this word wadar. You can imagine what that might mean from an Indo-European perspective. That means water, just like the English word. Right? And the genitive form, right? So the way of saying of water or waters in modern English is within us, right? So you notice that, well, one cool thing is you have the S that you still have even in modern English today to represent the meaning of, to represent possession, right? But what happened to the R? The R went away and it was changed to N. So, well, that's interesting, right? That's an alternation that you have in the morphology and the forms of this word within Hittite itself. So that's interesting as you're learning Hittite. But come over to the Germanic family and what do you find? Well, as we noted, English looks just like this nominative form, water, wadar, right? But what do you find in Old Norse? The word for water is what, right? Where you have this de-voiced N over here, right? You don't have an R at all, right? So where you have an R in this word in English, in its kindred language, you have an N. So whereas you have alternation between R and N within Hittite in this really early Indo-European period, that alternation survives within the Germanic fam family, but between languages at a later period between Old Norse and English among the Germanic languages. So another highlight I like is Tocharian. What is Tocharian? So that's the easternmost of the Indo ancient Indo-European languages. Its documents are found in the westernmost province of modern day China in the Xinjiang province. And the documents come from roughly 600 in the common era. So it's not so old, it's roughly uh, contemporary with Gothic, let's say, right? And the documents come from the area of the Tarim Basin in, in the Taklamakan Desert here in this ring of mountain ranges. And what do I find so interesting? Well, there are a million things interesting about Tocharian, which that's the subject of a whole nother talk. But one of the things that's interesting is that the Tocharian word for fish is lax. And you say, well, I eat bagels with cream cheese, if you at least come from the New greater New York area, like I do, right? So turns out in Old Norse, you have the word lax, 
and that means salmon. That's even in one of the famous sagas, the Laksdayana saga, right? This is the saga of the folks from the Salmon River Dale, right? In Old English, you had lax. In Old High German, you had lax. And then German was brought over in, especially in New York, in Jewish culture, and gave us the, our favorite topping for bagel and cream cheese, bagel and cream cheese with lox. That is, you put salmon on top. It's delicious. You have to have it if you haven't, right? But I'm sure you have, so you know what I'm talking about, right? So in the Germanic family, you have a very clear word meaning a particular type of fish, namely a salmon, that has become in Tocharian the general generic word for fish, right? So even in this incredibly distant Indo-European language, which was only roughly recently uh, deciphered, you find remnants of vocabulary you find familiar from the Germanic languages from Old Norse in particular. So to sum up, Old Norse not only reflects its Indo-European heritage, but it also transformed neighboring languages through ancient Scandinavians' far-flung exploits. So you saw how linguistic relationships rest on inheritance. We model linguistic relationships by saying commonalities derive from their having a shared parent language. And then we characterize their differences by sound rules that applied in different speaking communities whose pronunciation started to differ slightly uh, from other speaking communities. Uh, we saw how the linguistic interaction, especially of Old Norse with neighboring cultures, reflected cultural interaction as communities mingle, so to do their languages. And so borrowed terms actually show what general areas of ideas they shared, where different items, either commercial items or different ideas, went from one culture to another. And then we saw near the end there that linguistic traits can, in some sense, be recessive and dominant, right? You can have a really robust family tree, and then even small traits that are found on distant branches of the family tree can be reflected in interesting recurrences of that trait in the part of the tree you're focusing on, like in Old Norse from, for this discussion. So thank you for your attention. Please feel free to reach out with questions. My email is bobtod at utexas.edu. If you want to learn more, we've got several uh, free online resources at the Linguistics Research Center, in particular the, the course Old Norse Online. You can find those URLs here, and perhaps you might even know me in the future as the once and future author of Complete Old Norse. Hopefully someday that will see the light of day, and I hope if you find this topic interesting that that book will hopefully serve you well. If not, my apologies, but uh, I Hope to hear from you in the future. So thank you so very much for your time and have a wonderful day and stay safe. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah.